to tell you a story, um, a twists and turns about how I ended up talking about science. And in telling you that story, I'm going to share with you um, a philosophy that I have developed. And it's a philosophy which is dumb and simple. I heard a few. I heard a few. Really? So it wasn't obvious that I would ever end up uh, talking about science. Um, have a look at my school report. There we are. I went to Greycourt School. Uh, and that was me in uh, the third year at Greycourt School. Have a look at those results on the right. Uh, so 1A is good, and, um, and down at 5C is not so good. And you can see I'm only scraping in with physics, biology, and chemistry on a 3B, A, trying a bit harder in chemistry. Um, I wasn't really destined for a scientific career. I wasn't really destined for much of a, a, writ a writing career either. I wasn't doing uh, brilliantly in English. And actually, um, around this time, I was diagnosed as being dyslexic. Uh, so I, I felt I had the uh, um, odds stacked against me somewhat. Um, but I was quite good at PE and art. So there's always hope, isn't there? I had one A for PE and one A for art. Um, and this is what my physics teacher said about me at the time. She said, um, she's, sorry, me, I'm reading this. She's pleasant and hardworking and always presents good work. Now, that's because I was quite good at art and I used to like drawing the experiments up when you had to remember in the book when you had to do the template with the Bunsen burner. I was really good at that. Um, but it does say at the end that I do lack the understanding of complex concepts and difficulty in their application. And actually, that's still true today. <laughs> So I couldn't wait um, to leave the academic world, and I went to college and I studied art for a year. So by all rights, I should be standing here telling you about my art, and I should be a famous artist. But I got to college, and I was, um, had a reality check. I was quite good at school at art, but when I got in the at college, at school, um, at, at college studying art, I suddenly realised I really wasn't all that. In fact, I was not going to make a career out of this. So I had this reality, I'm going to have to do something, that I'm going to have a career and, and, and make some money. So I, I went off to the careers office, and I had a chat with them. And I came out 20 minutes later about to study electrical engineering. <laughs> Not the most obvious of things. Now, the reason this came about was because she asked me things I like doing at home. And it just so happened that my brother and I had been wiring up his bedroom with a burglar alarm so that when you came in and walked on the carpet, it set off all these alarms and bells. Because my brother and I both quite liking, like dabbling with circuits. And coupled with that, the college were desperate i desperate for a girl to study electrical engineering. <laughs> this is not the 50s or the 60s. This is the 1980s. They had no women on the course at all. So completely fueled by my hormones, I thought, result, I could get a boyfriend. <laughs> Only girl in the class. What could go wrong? So I turned up um, uh, uh, to study electrical engineering. I studied electrical engineering for two years, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved it. It was logical. It was interesting. And I got to the end of it. And I had no boyfriend. <laughs> and that's actually quite an important part of my story. Because there was this one guy, and I did really, really like him. And I spent two years kind of throwing myself at him shamelessly. <laughs> It's quite embarrassing looking back on it, actually. Um, and he had managed to get himself an apprenticeship. And he was telling the class, because he used to ignore me broadly, he was telling the class that he got an apprenticeship at somewhere called the National Physical Laboratory. And it was in Teddington. I thought, right, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be held back here. I'm going to pursue him further. <laughs> so... I went along to the National Physical Laboratory and asked them if they had any jobs. And they said, yeah, we are recruiting assistant scientific officers, uh, which is like a sort of a technician grade. And they gave me an interview because I had electrical engineering. In the interview, they didn't ask me much about my electrical engineering. They actually asked me quite a lot about hockey. Now, remember, I've been quite good at PE. <laughs> Uh, so I got offered a job. Now, it transpires that I got offered the job because they were short of women for the MPL hockey team. <laughs> but I actually hated hockey and never played it. Um, <clears throat> but I turned up at MPL, and 
oh, from day one, I found myself in an environment just, I was so happy and so engaged. If you've never been in a kind of research environment where you can ponder, you can ask questions, you can discuss, you can debate, you can find out answers. It, it was just a joy to be in and I absolutely loved it. I also found I had a bit of a skill um, that they didn't have there. I was a dab hand at soldering. <laughs> I could solder really, really quickly and I made this. Um, and I made this board and I spent ages debugging it and I did all the coding and everything as well because I learnt a computer program for all the chips on that. And that thing attached to it, I've got my pocket here just to show you how big it is. Now, if you've any idea what this might be, every single one of you today has one of these in your pocket or your handbag. This is the prototype of the pin, chip and pin card that you all use today. The card that you go and put into a slot, type in your number, and that's the work that we were working on. And that's what it originally looked like. Uh, it's not quite as portable. And, and if you don't believe I worked on it, here I am in my promotional shot of... Uh, <laughs> I look back at that, I thought, no wonder I didn't pull. <laughs> That was state of the art. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so there I was really happily at MPL um, and, and soldering and, and programming away, but not talking about science. So how did that happen? Well, it happened on a particular day. It was the 3rd of July, 1990, and it was announced that MPL would become an agency status. And what that meant is that MPL would have to justify and apply for its funding. Now, this was completely new, and, and there was near outrage at MPL, as much as scientists outrage, there was near outrage at having to justify the science to those people in Whitehall. How will they ever know? So not wishing to be defeated, I decided that I would apply myself to this. And I simply started asking simple and dumb questions and writing it down. And that's my philosophy. I just ask the dumb questions and I just provide a simple answer. I have to ask the dumb questions because I can't ask the clever ones because I was only average at school. And I can't write it down in a complicated way because my brain will just explode because it doesn't even see things um, in the right order on the page as it is. I was obviously quite good at this. Because by 1999, I had been through every single project that the whole of MPL was working on and had helped them write down and apply for funding for every single area. And that's probably over 500 projects I worked on. And that began the beginning of a career. And as um, the gentleman said who introduced me, I then went out, I went into Serco, I went into other government contracts and I started doing uh, simply this just asking dumb questions and then writing it down. So I can't stand here and tell you that's what I do without proving it to you. So I'm going to share with you a bit of science and I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to tell you about time. Time is the thing that governs our everyday life. It's completely embracing me at the moment because I have a counter down there that tells me I'm on 8.35 and I have to be off in less than 10 minutes. So time is amazing. It's, it's completely all-encompassing. You, 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 you're driven by it every single day. And you're driven by time, and we all have the same time. And the reason we all have the same time is because MPL have these amazing clocks. And this is what the clock looks like. Actually, it's not really the clock. Think of clocks in two different bits. If you think of a grandfather clock, you've got the ticking bit down the bottom that gives you the seconds, and then you've got the clock up the top that actually records the time. This machine here is actually the ticking part. It actually records and creates really, really, really accurate seconds. How accurate are these seconds? If I start this machine ticking over here and I travel off here for 60 million years, cough, it's not wide enough, 60 million years, it will only have drifted by one second. That's how accurate that clock is. 
And it's the seconds which are the really important bit about clocks. And they're the bit I'm going to tell you about. But the first thing you should always ask when you're, asked, you're trying to find out something technical is why. Why are you doing this? Why are you creating these accurate, accurate seconds? So let me take you back to 1955. This was the first atomic clock. Uh, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't look much like atomic clock either. But that was the first atomic clock built in 1955. Think about 1955. The only thing going on in 19... The, the most exciting thing that happened in 1955, I googled and found out, was that ITV started and the first episode of Dixon and Doc Green was on. <laughs> a mobile phone at that time was the phone in your kitchen on a really long cord that you used to drag around the house. Um, computers were probably... There was probably only five computers in the whole of the UK and they took up rooms not much uh, smaller than this whole room. But these guys came up with a way of developing and doing time at a much more accurate way than we have been doing with our mechanical clocks. And if they hadn't have done that, if they hadn't, you would not have this amazing device in your pocket. This device, which allows you to text and WhatsApp sort of immediately, watch videos, or if you're really lucky, actually tell you where you are in the world because you've got a satellite nav um, thing on it, that is completely reliant on really, really accurate timing. In fact, when you're standing next, looking at your phone, waiting for your satellite navigation thing to tell you where you are, and you're saying, come on, come on, come on, spare a little thought. There is just a limit to how quick we can make those signals whiz up to the satellites, come back down again, and work out where you are. In fact, we're right at the limit of timekeeping. Um, and this, these pe the people that make these devices and the people coming up with this technology are pushing us to say, you've got to make more accurate seconds. Because if you can make more accurate seconds, we can have more accurate timing, which means that we can have more interesting things going on on uh, your telephone. So that's why we make, um, that's why we, we have accurate time, is because it's allowed this amazing technical revolution. So I'm going to teach you about seconds, because as I said, the seconds are the really important bit in the clock. And that is how you make a second. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to read it. It's, it's, it's just too much to even read. Um, that is not the easiest thing to grasp at all. So I'm going to explain it in a way that hopefully you can get it. It's all about atoms. Atoms are amazing little things. If you take an atom and you apply some energy to it, it can change state. So it can start here, you can add some energy to it, and it can go to here. You take some energy away from it, it can jump down and come down to here. And atoms always do the same thing. If you keep giving it energy at the same level, it will always do the same thing over and over and over again for years. They're amazing. So we take this interesting thing about an atom, this fundamental about an atom, and we make that and turn it into a clock. And this is what the clock looks like. So on one side, we've got atoms, and they're coming out of an oven. We like to heat them up, make them feel comfy. They come along. We've got atoms coming in all different states. So we've got these, predominantly think of these two states. We want to chuck out all those who are in that state and just stick to these that are at this state. Then we're going to take them through what you could consider to be a radio tuner. And we're going to tune the atom with some energy. And we're going to go, and we're going to give it some energy. And hopefully, if we get exactly the right amount of energy, it will jump to the next state, and then it will go out the clock, and it will go out the top, and we'll count it. If we don't get exactly the right energy, it will go along and it will fall out the bottom, and we won't count it. So think of this as your world service. You're trying to get the world service on here, and the way you know that you've got the world service is because you're listening, and you can hear it. You can hear, yep, I've got that now, I'm can hearing it. The way we know that we've got that frequency at exactly the right place to make that atom go from this state to this state is by counting it. Because if all the atoms are changing state, we've got the tuner over here at exactly 
the right place. So bear with me, right back at the beginning, you've got your atoms coming out the oven, nicely heated up, two different states, chuck out them, we don't want them. Put these through into the tuner, tune it, get it to the right level so it will move states. And it comes out the other end and we count it and it goes round and round like that until we know that we've got this tuner working exactly right. Then that's when the magic happens. That tuner you can think of is like a sine wave. You all remember these from school. And the joy about these sine waves is you can count them. So we can count this sine wave going across. So it's one, two, three, four. And we use that counting to work out how long a second is. Now, do you remember that definition of a second I put up with that horrendously long number? 9,192,631,770. That's how many of these go along before you get a second. Honest to God, it'll look like this, or even worse. Over 9 billion, and you've got a second. And suddenly you can think, 9, nine billion? For one second, suddenly you can realise, actually, how can we make the second even more accurate? Because actually, four and a half billion is half a second. Two billion is a quarter of a second. And so it can go down and down and down and down. And that enables us to measure the second really accurately because we've got this great big range that we can get out. So the next question we need to ask is, that's all very well, so you've now got your really accurate second and you use that to create time, you use that to create a clock. But how do you know that your clock is telling the right time compared to another clock? If you go and buy a clock, you take it home and you'll check it against something, won't you? You'll put the radio on, listen for the pips or the, the bongs or you'll look at the computer. The way we do it is amazing. I'm going to introduce to you the symphony of atomic clocks. There is an organisation in um, Paris who is the World Timekeepers. What a title. The World Timekeepers. And there are atomic clocks like the one at MPL all round the world. There's about 230 of them, so that's quite a nicely sized orchestra. And they're all telling the time at the same time. And you imagine the conductor is the person that's keeping all of them just in tune. They're not, play, they don't, they're not a clock. They don't have a clock. They're keeping all of the world clocks just in time with each other. So if you go back to my whole kind of atoms, chuck it out, tune it, count it. Imagine that's the orchestra tuning up. That's the messy bit at the beginning before the performance. And all that noise. Then it starts and all those clocks are telling the time. And this organisation is making sure that everybody is ticking and saying the right time. Now, what happens if you're not? Well, they'll tell you. And every so often, you have to adjust your clock. Adjust the clock, I hear you cry. Adjust the clock, I hear you cry. <laughs> it's a bit early for panto, isn't it? <laughs> And we have a man at MPL called Peter, and he adjusts time <laughs> for the UK. He cannot be blamed when you've lost an hour of your time and you didn't know what the hell you did with yourself. He adjusts time at tiny, tiny levels to make sure that our clocks are in time with the whole of the rest of the world. And that's how we measure time. I've talked to quite a lot of scientists about what I do, and I've, I've worried that am I, am, I, um, am I kind of dumbing down your science? And, and because I know it's far more complicated than that. But for me, my job is simply to try and share what we do in a way that you can be interested. You can actually maybe want to ask a question yourself. Even if you just thought, I didn't know that. And actually, that's quite interesting. I feel that I've, I've kind of, I've done my job. And I'd like to put a plea out to all of you on my dumb and simple philosophy. I challenge you, why don't you try and ask some of the dumb um, questions? And why don't you demand some simple solutions? Next time you're in a technology shop being bamboozled by some youth 
on which version of the iPad I should be buying when I'm not quite sure what a gigabyte and a megabyte and all these different things are. Or next time you're having a conversation with a mechanic about your, why your car's failed the MOT. Or next time you're sitting in a lesson and you're not getting what the teacher's telling you. Ask the dumb question, because believe you me, everybody else will be thinking it. And demand a, a, a simple answer. I was talking to one of the time scientists at MPL uh, about giving this talk. And um, he was really sweet. And he said to me, what you're doing is not simple. Actually, Fiona, what you're doing is you're making it accessible. And you're certainly not dumb. Actually, you're asking the fundamental questions. And you should keep doing that. And I intend to. Thank you. Mm -hmm.